I would like to thank you very much for organizing this very important conference on justice. And I want to thank all of you that are right now under the sound of my voice. Uh, it is a great privilege and honor for me to participate in this very God-honoring project. I will um, present on a subject matter that is very close to my heart. And for my title today, I'm talking about observance of justice, which of course entails inclusion, equality, and equity. Observance of such justice being the foundation of worship and nationhood. As a way of introduction, uh, I would like to say that for those of you that have read and know about Zimbabwe, a country located in the southern part of Africa, you will note that the, uh, uh, the country has, has journeyed through torrid cycles of darkness right from our independence honeymoon. As such, it would not be inaccurate to posit that during the 41 years of its independence, Zimbabwe has had indelible scars. To put it in the words of one Professor S.N. Gacheni, unquote, I quote, Zimbabwe's challenge is not corruption, looting, state capture, etc., but the failure to construct a nation state, a failure to construct a nation state in 1980, uh, close quotes. Now, the party state model of 1980 caused us a myriad of challenges, including polarization along political party lines, gender, race, class, tribe, among others. This polarization, ladies and gentlemen, resulted in broken relationships that actually ushered in all sorts of hurts and injuries. Massacres in the southern part of the country that claimed about 20,000 civilians from 1980 to 1987 are a major, major setback that we have had in this great country. Cycles of blood elections, abductions, maimings, cases of arson, among many, are a direct result of the aforesaid polarization. And I want us to understand right from the very offset, of offset that uh, all these things did happen as a result of our government to recognize the value of the you know, human dignity. Personal story. I just want to talk to you about my personal story because it is very, it is very much linked to this, our history. Now, I'm, I'm working with an organization called Zimbabwe Divine Destiny uh, that I formed, or founded in response to a deteriorating situation of politically motivated violence in 2008, that saw people maimed, killed, uh, displaced for belonging to a political party, um, actually, that was uh, not favored by perpetrators of violence. It was glaring to note that the church at large did not admonish the perpetrators of such evils, despite being custodians of moral values and righteous living. The key reasons for this failure on the part of the church to uh, hold national leadership accountable were identified as follows. Number one, limited theological understanding of the church's role in governance and national development. In other words, uh, the church would find it very difficult to understand the, the role in terms of uh, uh, governance. In other words, you would have uh, people that would feel that, uh, you know, church should not be involved in politics. Uh, politics is the dirty game. And I have always out argued that, no, politics is not a dirty game. Politics is a clean game. Actually, it is the players of the game that are actually dirty, right? So we need to get rid of dirty players of politics. 
in order to clean up, you know, that phenomenon, that politics. The second limitation, failure by most churches, you know, church leaders to actually articulate and relate citizen struggles to national governance issues such as economics, national policies, and electoral uh, uh, processes. In other words, uh, church leaders would find it very difficult to relate people's struggles to governance, right? So people would feel the stadia, you know, coming to church where preachers would preach so powerfully and appeal to the people to give their lives to Christ and people would respond to the altar calls, right? And most of the, you know, uh, uh, challenges that the people would present on altar were economic. But you see, our church leaders would not be able to relate, to relate such challenges to misgovernance. Also, what they would do would just be to pray, you know, for these um, congregants and even to cast out devils from them instead of simply analyzing and being able to do the way uh, 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 prophet Isaiah did in verse uh, chapter number 1 verses 21 to 23 where he relays the loss of currents of for Israeli um, uh, the, the, the loss of uh, Israel value to, of, of the Israeli currents to corruption to violence to injustice now, if you read uh, 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 Isaiah chapter number 1, verse 21 to 23, you will notice um, Isaiah's clarity on that. But the third limitation was a deep-rooted fear of victimization by state security agents and political actors. And I want you to understand that this was not fear of the unknown. It was fear of the unknown. Now, after taking care of 450 victims of political violence, and successfully managing to reintegrate most of them back into their original communities, more acts of violence continue to happen in the country. Shocked by the church silence, I mobilized like-minded church leaders to begin a campaign to end political violence through biblical admonitions to communities and national leaders. Setting up local peace committees, uh, LPCs that sought to bring local leaders to account, lobbying national leaders over social and economic justice through petitioning cabinet and parliament. We also, um, from time to time, conduct peaceful, and I mean very peaceful, demonstrations modeled after Martin Luther King Jr.'s 1950s and 60s nonviolent. Uh, activism in the USA. And I want you to know that regardless of how very peaceful these were, the brutal show of force on the part of our state security agency would actually descend heavily on us. And uh, I am a victim of several arrests. The campaign escalated until several church leaders began to identify formally with the initiative. This gave rise to Zimbabwe Divine Destiny, uh, whose key mandate involves uh, building capacity of church leaders uh, to boldly speak out and be agents of social, economic, uh, political justice. Uh, so to date, we have actually trained around 2,000 church leaders throughout the country and resulting from this has been more voices speaking out against social uh, injustices. Coordinating communities to bring these local leaders to account for peace and justice. But also mentorship of uh, politicians towards what we would call values-based leadership and educating the electorate to vote for the same our motivation what is our motivation you may want to know why is it that why is it that we do what we do what inspires us number one desire to see the will of god on earth as it is in heaven you know the lord has taught us to pray this prayer let your will be done on earth as it is done in heaven this is matthew chapter number six obedience to the heavenly calling this is x chapter number 26 verse 19 so we want to be obedient 
to the heavenly call. So we proclaim together with Paul when he had uh, uh, administered deliverance on that uh, uh, damsel in chapter number 16 of the book of Acts who was possessed by evil spirits. And because they were uh, leaders that flourished on the basis of this woman's operation, uh, Paul ended up in prison. And so he declared, I was not disobedient to the heavenly visions. But also Psalm number 133, verse 1 to 3. Uh, but also desire to see a new epoch, uh, which is a departure from evil to righteous governance systems. We are pained by how the weak and vulnerable are, 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 are helplessly scattered like sheep without a, a shepherd. Uh, Job chapter number 29, verse 7, 15 to 17. Matthew chapter number 9, verse 36 to 38. Proverbs chapter number 31, verse 8 and 9. Uh, desire to see peace, justice, and prosperity for all citizens and the nation as a whole. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter number 26, or rather chapter number 16, verse 20. Desire to see a blessed nation. Micah 4, verses 1 to 4. Isaiah 2, verses 1 to uh, 4. Just to, as I uh, go further, I want to look now at more in-depth analysis of uh, scriptures on justice. More in-depth analysis of scriptures on justice. As I journey further on this subject matter, I want us to have a look at Amos chapter number 5 verses 21 to 24. This is my favorite portion of scripture that has really inspired me. Verse number one, 21. I hate... I despise your religious festivals. Your assemblies are a stench to me. In other words, they are smelling. Even though you bring me burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. Though you bring choicey fellowship offering, I will not have regard for them. 23. Away with the noise of your songs, I will not listen to the music of your harps. Can you imagine? Verse number 24. Take note here, a turning point, but let justice roll like a river, righteousness like a never-failing stream. Now, as one reads through this portion of scripture, they are struck by how God seemingly detests, how God seemingly detests eh? practices, rites, institutions of worship that he had established. Looking back from the time that this prophetic charge is given, God had instituted a culture of worship where stringed instruments, harps, vials were a part of, where cereal offerings and fattened beast offerings were given. Why is it then that suddenly God expressed his detest of such? The answer is simple. Their acts of worship were void of power were void of the power of God which would ordinarily manifest itself in active social uh, justice. A call to justice therefore expressed in verse number 24 points to the lifestyle that should underpin not only our worship but the values of any nation. On the basis of this portion of scripture, it is not right for any Christian organization to gather and worship in a space and context where uh, 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 social injustices are rampant and remain quiet. In other words, after a conference such as this, we need to be able to look around uh, the world around us and to see whether they are any acts of justice, and we issue a statement accordingly. Not only is justice a part of any worship service, but condemnation of injustice. Not only is justice a part of true nationhood, but condemnation of injustices. If social injustices are a major cause of broken relationships, then restoration of justice will cause restoration of relationships. The psalmist Number 85 verse 10 uses four personified concepts that are critical to the stability of any nation or institution. I quote, truth and mercy have met together. Justice and peace have kissed each other. So this is 
powerful. These are powerful concepts that the psalmist uses to really illustrate the value of justice. When truth is told, justice, justice will happen. When truth is told, mercy happens. Mercy simply means, uh, re represents forgiveness. And then justice is executed and peace follows suit. Now, how do I understand justice? So justice defined. Justice simply put is the fair treatment of your fellow human beings which is based on equity, genuineness, and equal access to the protection of our laws. Right? So you don't have one law that applies for the other and then the law that applies for other different people. On the basis of the Bible, the word justice and righteousness are used interchangeably because the original, in the original uh, Hebrew language, they share the, the, the same root meaning. If righteousness essentially denotes men's right standing with God, then justice becomes the manifestation of such righteousness. Now, important observations from the red portion of scripture, which is um, um, uh, Amos chapter number 5, verse 21 to 24. Number one, God hates and despises any act of worship, including church attendance, that is void of justice. Observation number two, God regards justice, mercy, and love as weightier matters of the law than giving offerings and payment of tithes. Christ makes it very clear as he ridicules the Pharisees who were uh, very keen on payment of tithes. And Christ says to them, now, come on, you should have done one thing without neglect, neglecting the other. Yes, payment of tithes, yes, giving of offerings, but also... Uh, observing weightier matters of the law. So justice is weightier than payment of, tithe, of, of, of tithes. Number three observation, right? Condemnation of all social injustice should therefore be part of our worship services in the very same way that our acts of justice should be. Observation number four, injustice have no justification whatsoever. Injustices have no justification whatsoever whether uh, such acts are committed under the guise of preserving supremacy of a political party, like in the case of uh, uh, my country, or the purity of any race and or monarchy. The recent developments within the British monarchy resulting in Prince Harry and his family leaving the royal institution is a clearest evidence of the fallenness of humanity and the sin-conditioned world within which humanity operates. This is so regardless of how religious they may be. A very unfortunate situation is presented here where because Harry and Meghan's child would be a person of color, the same would would, would not carry royal title. I think you have followed this story, which is very unfortunate. Such an outright racist exclusionary approach to business, whether they be business in the monarchy, is not only unchristian, but obnoxious and a misfit in the postmodernity. Other biblical affirmations of justice. Number one, God instructed Israel to treat aliens or foreigners justly because God loves them. Deuteronomy chapter uh, 10 verse 18. Number two, our Lord Jesus Christ would lash the Pharisees for selective application of the law. John chapter number 8 verse 1 to 11. You remember this woman who is brought to Jesus for having committed adultery. But you see the Pharisees do not bring the uh, uh, men with whom adultery is committed. You know it takes two to entangle. Uh, number three, Apostle Paul charges masters to treat their uh, uh, servants justly and also servants to be responsible in their work. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 5 to 9. Uh, number four, Apostle James warns against treating people on the basis of their social status. Chapter 2, verses 1 to 4. Five, Job's, Job's credentials, uh, justice credentials, are clearly shown when he refers to to how he sought the cause of the strangers to execute justice to them. He was a father 
to the fatherless, feet to the limb, and eyes to the blind. This is Job chapter number 21, verse 15 uh, to 17. I, I love this portion of scripture as well. So Job had to actually hunt out, hunt out for the cause of the foreigner. Now, clearly emerging from this foregoing are the following. All this that we've said. First, all human beings, regardless of race, tribe, sex, are equal in essence before God and should be treated accordingly. Second, the principle of equity, which is about giving people what they need in order to make things fair, best captures the spirit of true equality which runs through the scriptures. I, I hope you do understand that, that, that there's a difference between equality and equity. I, I find equity a bit high because equity looks at the differences. If you have in the room uh, people that need to uh, touch the ceiling, uh, they are required to do that and there is a short person. You know, equity means that you give a stool to this short person in, in order for him to reach the height that everybody else reaches, right? So that is equity. Look for those differences and uh, meet the needs accordingly. It is this equality that makes us all access opportunities for self-actualization. When that happens, justice becomes a reality. Third, inclusion of the minority uh, groups such as... Uh, foreigners, minority uh, race and the disability sector among others in determining how they should be treated will go a long way in ensuring justice. In other words, uh, these minority groups should be involved in determining how they should be handled. Fourth, injustice does not become unjust because uh, because uh, it, it has actually happened to those you love and know. Look up look up for the cause of those that you are not related to and fight for them. This is what we see in Job. Now, I want to bring this uh, matter to a conclusion. Right. I have highlighted here Zimbabwe's storied cycles of political history and its faulty foundations right from independence. We failed to construct a nation state. We, 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 we constructed a party state where one part uh, felt that they were supreme and uh, caused a fractured nation. I've shown you how the failure to construct a nation state and inversely the creation of party state birthed polarization. I've also chronicled my personal story of fighting against injustice. I have presented the biblical perspective on justice and have attempted to illustrate the universality of the ailing of human heart as it falls short of God's glory in the area of justice. I have endeavored to demonstrate uh, that equity, equality, and therefore inclusion are at the heart of justice. Yet humanity in its fallen state and broken relationship with God cannot be uh, able to observe these values. In light of all this, it is uh, through the restoration of our relationship with God that the restoration of justice will be realized. And noting this, noting this truth, Prophet Isaiah makes a clarion call, a clarion and a passionate plea when he writes, Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be as red as scarlet, though um, your sins be as red as crimson, they shall be as white as snow. This is the call of God to reconcile with him so that in turn we reconcile with the world around us. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you.